you have your Bibles, I ask you to turn to John chapter 15. If you haven't, a few weeks ago when we passed these out, the, the bookmarkers, there's plenty back there on the table and on the Welcome Center when you start to leave. If you'd like one of these, I encourage you to get one. We have these six things, the responsibilities here at, at, for our church. And my challenge to all of us is that we take these bookmarkers and we pray over them and we ask the Lord, which area do we need to work on in our life that, that we exemplify these characteristics? John chapter 15 is an incredible chapter. It has impacted my life so many ways. If you've ever wanted to know what is an area in the Bible that I ought to memorize, the first thing I always try to encourage people is try to memorize John chapter 15. That entire chapter is red letters. That's Jesus talking. I don't, can't imagine memorizing anything more than the red letters. When <clears throat> uh, one time I was working with this group of guys, and there was this one guy that I was kind of partnered with, and... He was a Christian, but he kind of backslidden. Uh, him and his wife had been married, and they just had a, a new little girl. And, but, but the priorities weren't really there in his life. And so I shared the gospel with him and talked to him about the Lord, and, and he assured me of his salvation, but he just didn't have that walk with God that he needed to have. So on the work sites where we would have to work, we would have to travel about 45 minutes to get to the work site that we were working at. So while we were in the vehicle, I had a captive audience. And I challenged him. I said, why don't we try to start memorizing some scripture? So I, I, he said, well, I'd like to memorize some red letters. I said, I know a chapter, nothing but red letters. Well, we started with verse 1. And by the time we finished, we had got the entire chapter memorized. This guy, that chapter changed his heart, changed his life. He became a godly father. A, a, a godly man in his community. He became a leader, a Sunday school teacher in his church. He then later became a deacon and started doing mission projects. God has done miraculous things in this young man's life because of John chapter 15. So one of the things I want to share with you is if you would like to memorize some scripture, I challenge you start with John chapter 15. But today we're talking about compassion. Live with compassion. God showed you compassion. He showed me compassion when he sent his one and only son to die for us. I can't imagine any more beautiful picture than showing compassion. This is our fourth part of this series that we're working on, the responsibilities of a church member. I ask you to look there in John chapter 15. Look at verse 9. It says, as the. I want you to catch that word, the. It doesn't say certain someone else's, but it says the particular. It has a direction of a direction that you and I had to realize that it's not painted with a broad brush. It is being direct. It is saying, as the Father has loved me. Jesus is telling you and me, he's saying, the Father has loved him. And he gives a painting of this whole entire chapter about a relationship with him and the Father. In this verse, he's saying, as the Father has loved me, comma, so have I loved you. Do you realize that this is like a seesaw? The first part of the seesaw, when the person gets on and the seesaw drops down, the other end is way up, so that person hasn't got on the seesaw yet. But the first part, before the seesaw can even start seesawing, it has to start with the Father. The love between Jesus and the Father. There's no way that Jesus was able to love you and me until the love with the Father. Now let's make that personal. There's no way that you and I can love one another with a Christ-like love unless we got a love for the Father. Amen. You see, it has to start there, just like with Jesus. Before he could do any kind of loving out here, it had to start with loving here. It couldn't be loving the sun. It couldn't be loving the stars. It couldn't be loving the moon. It couldn't be loving all these planets. It couldn't be loving all these false gods that they had. It said, the Father, the one and only God. 
And it, the love had to start there before the love could start here. And then it continues on in this verse. It doesn't stop there. After the period of verse 9, it says, abide in my love. Jesus is saying, look, the love had to start between me and my father. Then I was able to love you. And now this love that I love you, you're able to love me. Because why? You abide in my love. You see, for the seesaw to work, it had to start with the love between Jesus and the Father. Then the next part of the seesaw, when that moved, it became between us and Jesus, the seesaw of the love. And it was all under one that the love, it all happened because of the love for the Father, the love for us. Do you have trouble loving people? Do you have trouble getting by some of the, the blemishes and the warts and the harshness and just sometimes it's just hard to love certain people. But do, do you even try to get past it or you just blow it off? You see, let's just be honest about it. There's some that's easier to love than others. But Jesus has called us to love all. God created us all the way he created us. Why? You'll have to ask him when you get there. But here's the thing. Sometimes when we struggle loving people here, it's because we're struggling loving the Father there. And the first thing that you and I have to do is we have to do a heart check. Because there's no way you and I can show compassion to one another until we know that our love and our compassion is for the Father. And this verse shows us that, that it has to start with the Father. Now drop down to verse 10. Look at the first two words of this verse. If you. You see, there is a choice. There is an option. If you make this choice. It's not the person sitting to your right, not the person sitting to your left, not your mama, not your daddy, not your grandma, not your grandpa. Not even your preacher or your Sunday school teacher. There is a choice in this verse that you and I have to make. If you. Now catch this. If you keep my commandments. Do you realize that you can't keep God's commandments from me? And I can't keep them for you. You and I are responsible for the life in which the Lord has given you and has given me. We have a choice. We can live the way God desires for us to live, or we can live the way the world desires for us to live. So it starts, this verse starts off with the first two words. If you, if you do this, meaning... The scripture says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Now remember what the last part of that, that verse 9 was, if you abide in my love. How do you and I abide in the love of God? By the way we live. You see, I can show my wife, I can tell her I love you. But if I talk to her like a dog and I treat her like a dog and I'm disrespectful to her and my children, what kind of love is that? But if I tell my wife I love her, I show her I love her every day. I honor her the way the Lord tells me to honor her. I try to serve her in any way that I can. What am I doing? I'm showing her love. My wife has no question, does my husband love me? Because in every form and fashion, I do everything I can to show her I love her. She never has to question that. Now let's flip that to our relationship with the Lord. If the Lord was to look at how you keep his commandments, would he question, do you love him? Would there be a big question mark? I ain't sure if you really love me because you sure don't keep my commandments. You sure the way you talk, you sure the way you live, it sure don't look nothing like me. It sure don't look like nothing my scripture tells you to do. Now, let's think. There's a picture here. He says, if you keep my commandments, we we'll abide in his love. Now, this ain't talking about salvation. Salvation comes through putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And that's the only way to salvation. But once we receive that salvation through Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility in how we live 
and we betray Jesus Christ in that cross. And that's what this is talking about. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, this verse is talking to you. If you're here today and you say, Wes, I don't know Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, this is the responsibility you have if you trust, trust in Jesus, is to obey his commandments, is to abide in his love. Continues on in this verse. Remember the first two words. If you, next part of this verse, just as I have kept my Father's commandments. You see, Jesus himself, in whom set the example for all Christians, in whom was willing to lay his life down for all people, not just certain few, not just for a select few, he died for all the world, the scripture says. See, if you, now this, this flips this to Jesus. Jesus says, I chose to keep my Father's commandments. See, there in this verse, he says, just as I kept my Father's commandments. You see, Jesus chose to keep his Father's commandments. And then check out the next part of that verse. And abide in his love. You see, it shows a picture to you and me that how Jesus abided in the Father's love. How? Because he kept the Father's commandments. How are you and I to live? We are to abide in the Father's love. How? By the way we live. By the way we keep His commandments. So if we were able to use a measuring stick by the way you just lived last week, would that measuring stick show that you love God? Would that measuring stick show that you have a relationship with the Father? Only you can answer that. You're responsible for what your measure stick shows. I'm responsible for my measure stick and what it shows. If you make this choice to keep the commandments. Continues on in verse 11. It says, these things I have spoken to you. Now remember, this is Jesus talking. He's saying, look, I've spoken to you. I've shared these things with you. And then he comes on into this verse. He said, that my joy may be in you. Where's that joy of Jesus? Where's it supposed to be? In you. In me. In the Christians. How is that joy in you and in me? By accomplishing that, that Jesus just spoke in verse 9 and in verse 10. And then the last part of this verse, and it's real neat how this verse is written. It says that your joy may be full. Now, the NIV, instead of the word full, it uses the word complete. And I really like that, that word to me. That, that really shows when you see the word complete, it means it's done, finished. And, and I really like that, that word complete. But, but here, it, show, it uses the word full. And here's the thing. Where does our joy come from? Our joy, it comes from that of Christ that is, because he says, my joy may be in you and that it may your joy may be full you see it affects our joy when Jesus' joy comes into us how does the joy come into us by the way we live by the way we abide into his word by the way we abide into his commandments you see you and I have a choice there's no way that we can show compassion and love to anyone until we're abiding in him and allowing his joy to be complete in us. I didn't use the word happy. Happy is an emotion. It's up and down like a roller coaster. But joy is something that is solid. And it's steady. But there's going to be things that may rack, shake your foundation. You may question some things. But that joy, when Jesus has made it full and complete in your heart and your life. You're always able to cling to it. Amen. Now, look at the next verse. This is my commandment. That you love one another. Now, you realize verse 9, 10, and 11, he, he put those together. 9, 10, and 11 was dealing how we are to abide in a love and all this. Now, all of a sudden, verse 12 happens. And when verse 12 happens, Jesus is giving us another direction in our life. 
He, he's given us another challenge by saying, this is my commandment, that you love one another. Remember those people that are hard to love? Yep. That ain't my words. That's the red letters. You got to love them. And then it continues on in verse 12. As I have loved you. You see, you know those times those people slap you, stab you, thorn in the side, rub you wrong? Yeah, we got to love them. Imagine how we make those wounds on Jesus, those scars on Jesus' arms and legs and side when you and I sin and we mess up. That's pretty much the way people do us when they rub us wrong. I imagine we rub Jesus wrong when we get out of line with him. But this verse here, he says, you love one another as I've loved you. I'm going to tell you all something. I am a sinner saved by grace. And there was a lot of sin that had to cover a lot of grace in my life. It still does. But he loved me. And because of that love and that mercy and that grace that covered over my sins, I have a responsibility in how I love others. Do you notice in this verse, you don't see a choice? Do you notice there's not an option? You don't see a if you. <laughs> there's not, okay, you have a choice. You can do good or bad. Uh-uh. You can do right or wrong. Uh-uh. It says, this is how it is. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No option there. He is commanding you and me to do that. And if you notice on those bookmarkers, the way it is worded, the way we wrote it down is live with compassion. That bookmarker. Do you realize what this is meaning? We have to live compassion every day. We can't just set a special week or a special moment or a special event or a special activity and show compassion. We are to live with it. No option. And then all of a sudden, verse 13 happens. After he's commanded us to love others as he's loved us. It says, greater love has no one than that, than this. That someone lay down his life for his friends. You know, I would have no problem laying my life down for one of my children. And you know... Our children are very special to us, and grandchildren, for some of you that have grandchildren, you probably, without hesitation, would jump right there in front of a situation to lay your life down for them. And then you say, well, I got some friends that I love and I'm very close to. I would lay my life down for them. That's great love. But really what this verse is really showing you and me, it's not about the word friends. Because if you think about the way the scripture is written in verse 12, we're to love all the way Jesus has loves us, meaning all should be our friends. So verse 13 is really telling you and me we should be willing to lay our life down for anyone. Because Jesus did. He laid his life down for all. You and I have a responsibility that we love others. We show compassion. We live compassion on a daily basis in such a manner that we're willing to lay our lives down for all. I don't know about you, but I know with myself, I struggle sometimes. But in this chapter, and in these passages that we just looked, or verses that we just looked at in this chapter, I can't but think about all of us how are we living? How is the, the life that we're portraying and reflecting to others? You know, we have a responsibility with our relationship with God. And if you've fallen asleep through this message, I ask you to wake up and just stay with me for about three more sentences and we're fixing to be through. Okay? Here's the thing. 
If you're not doing your responsibility for your relationship with God, you're not just hurting yourself, you're hurting the entire church. And this is why. God has gifted you in a certain way. It may be your smile. It may just be a touch. It may be your act of service. But see, you're not smiling, you're not touching, and you're not doing acts of service when you're not right with God. And guess what happens? The church suffers. I suffer. All members of the church suffer because we're missing out on the blessing that you provide to all. We have a responsibility to get back in step with God, get back in love with the Father, that we can love others and minister to all. But it's not going to happen until it starts with the Father just like these verses show. Let's pray. Father.